I think the most important thing to do is to is to only do projects that you believe in, because ultimately your integrity depends on that. Episode ninety eight. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world, and here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we talk with the world's leading architects, consultants, and others about how to create the architecture practice of your dreams—a practice that is impactful, successful, and profitable. If you believe that great design. Can go hand in hand with financial reward, and that money, art, and social responsibility can peacefully coexist together. Then you are in the right place. Welcome to the business of architecture. This episode is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. You know they've been sponsoring the show here for over six months now, and in December they gave me an account to one seat, one license of ArchiOffice to use in my practice, and I look forward to diving into that over the next couple of months and sharing with you my thoughts about using that program to manage projects and to manage finances. You can go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. As always, if you want to be famous, leave the show a rating on iTunes, and I'll read your comment out over the show to the thousands of listeners. Here's a comment left by FreeJ193 recently: "The business of architecture show. It ain't great. It's fantastic. What happens during all these interviews is one of those need to know stuff they don't bother teaching you at school. At least that's my case. I would rate it at least 9.9 stars out of 10 if that's possible." The best part is, it sounds like it's just a conversation between two casual people, with all your questions being answered. Free J, thank you so much for dropping that comment. I appreciate it. Truly, that is what I'm trying to make business of architecture here for you, the listener. You know, I want this to be your virtual mentorship, where you can tune in and learn from some of the world's most successful and fascinating architects, like the one we have on the show today. Today's show, we're going to catch up with architect Frank Harmon, FAIA. In this interview, he reflects on lessons learned from forty plus years of practice. And here is our show. Frank Harmon is one of America's great architects. Frank Harmon, FAIA, has designed sustainable modern buildings across the Southeast for thirty years. He's an educator at North Carolina State University. A writer and an illustrator at NativePlaces.org, engages architects through public outreach at Activate 14. In addition, the firm Frank Harmon Architect has received over 37 AI North Carolina awards as of 2010, according to Wikipedia. In 2003, a vacation house he designed in the Bahamas was named Project of the Year by Residential Architect Magazine. In 2005, the same magazine named his firm Top Firm of the Year, and Frank Harmon Architect has been named. To Architects Magazine's top 50 list three times. Frank Harmon, welcome to Business of Architecture. It's good to be here. Frank, out of all of those awards that you've received, which one is the most meaningful to you? <laughs> um. Well, to be honest, I don't do buildings for awards. Um, the greatest satisfaction, greatest satisfaction I get is having people enjoy the environments that we've created: a classroom where children like to be, a garden where folks can sit out in the evening and talk to their friends, or an office building where it's so spacious and well lit that it's just a pleasure to come into work in the morning. Those are those are the rewards. <laughs> as far as the awards are concerned,、um, probably the、um, the gold medal given to me two years ago by the AIA North Carolina, because it represents recognition by my peers, you know, by other architects. But you know, like I say, what. I don't do work for awards. I, I do it for the reward of serving other people. And which of your which of your projects has brought you the most reward in terms of what you've been able to see through the lives or the people that you've been able to help and serve? 
Well, there are a number. Of, of course, the one that's dearest to me is my own house. I designed with my wife 25 years ago, and we subsequently built, and the, our, our children grew up there, and uh, we made this beautiful garden, and uh, that, that, uh, I, I'm happy every morning I wake up there. So that's personally the most, because, you know, I, I experience it the most. Um, another interesting project was a fertilizer shed. That, that's probably gotten more recognition than any single project I've ever done. It's a fertilizer shed. It's for a garden center. And, um, you know, it's, it's beautifully detailed and quite simply built, but it was chosen by Time Magazine in 1988 as one of the 10 best buildings in America, which I thought was really cool because the other buildings were skyscrapers or, you know, things like that. But they chose this because it was an example of an architect taking a modest and often overlooked building type, a utility shed, and giving it a lot of attention. So that one got a, quite a lot of press. Uh, recently, we've done a very small house for uh, two clients in near Beaufort, South Carolina. The whole house costs $150,000, uh, which is quite modest. I mean, some of our houses, a single room will cost that much. But this house has gotten a lot of attention, rightfully so, because it's so simple and, and beautiful on in its site and surroundings. You know, there, there's nothing about this house that's not essential. In fact, I would say it's a house that deals with the essentials of living in a, in a beautiful site next to the water. Tell me a little bit more about that house in Beaufort, South Carolina. Is it right? That's just up the coast from Charleston, right? Down the coast, Down the, the south coast. of Charleston. Um, the, the, the site is actually St. Helena Island, which is a large island next to Beaufort. And it's, it's quite rural. It's very, very much back country. But the couple who built the house, uh, John and Sabrina, uh, were from Boston, and they wanted a house where they could get away from the winters in Boston and just live there. They decided to take early retirement, and they asked us to design a house for them. And when I went there and talked about it with them and they told me what their budget was. I said, you know, it's going to be very hard to do this. Um, the house is in a flood zone, and putting the house up on pilings alone will cost you $30,000. So that's 20% of your budget. So what I recommended was that they make half the house open air and half enclosed. It's a, it's a concept I've used for a number of years that you screen in uh, half the house and make it essentially a big screen porch and then you heat and cool the other half of the house and in in Beaufort it's a very mild climate and you can go outdoors almost every day of the year comfortably so my thought was that by having these outdoor areas they could live in that part of the house for at least nine months of the year and then retreat when it's really hot or really chilly to the heated and cool portion of the house. The point being that a screen porch costs half as much to build as a, as a heated and cooled area. So in other words, they could afford more house by making it mostly open, and it's been very successful. I've done this in other places. I did one 20 years ago in Columbia, North Carolina, on the Scuppernong River, and uh, that was very successful. And I've also done a number of classrooms for um, uh, environmentally based education, which are open air, basically big screen porches. It's a, it's a subject I'm very fond of in the South because we do have a, you know, a mostly mild climate. Even in North Carolina, uh, in the Piedmont where we live, there's not a week in the year that you can't go and sit outdoors. I mean, uh, two weeks ago, for example, it was 10 degrees here. It was very cold. Today, it's going to be 75 degrees. So we're still in mid-March, you know, it's late winter. So a house or a house designed with a garden to go with it, where you can live outdoors for much of the time, you just get a lot more for your investment.
Frank, you've said that there is more wisdom in African American gardens and yards in the rural South than in a million McMansions. And it seems that this ties into what you were just talking about right now in terms of some of the design strategies that you've used. Could you talk a little bit about what you meant by that quote? Yes, well, I've been a student of, you know, vernacular buildings for decades. I, uh, you know, it, it, people who, who built farmhouses for themselves had to pay attention to the site and the materials and the climate. They had to. They didn't have any choice. Their lives depended on being able to open the windows and get cross ventilation. It depended on having shade in the middle of the summer, but the sun to warm the house in the in the winter. So it gave me sort of a fresh pair of eyes for looking at architecture by learning what I had seen people using a hundred years ago. So the reason I'm I'm so interested in African American yards and porches and buildings is that they've been fairly well documented by a geographer at the uh, University of Georgia named Richard Westmacott. And he and his graduate students have been measuring African American houses and gardens for about two decades and they're published in a book. It's called African American uh, Yards and Gardens. And what you can see looking at these plans is that they all pay very close attention to orientation, to sunlight, to hydrology, to where the cold winds are coming from, um, where the animals are housed in relationship to the house. And out, out of that, you can derive some very sound principles that are just as valid today as they might have been 100 years ago when those houses were built. Now, the fact is that most of our houses we build today, we can, we, can, we're, we can ignore that, we think. We've got air conditioning, we've got double glazing, we've got mesh curtains. So we can pretty much shut ourselves off from the environment. Nothing wrong with that, but I've always found there's a lot more pleasure and satisfaction to being warm or cool and comfortable, and at the same time being able to enjoy the outdoors. So. If you, if you make a house or a school based on these principles, you can, of course, air conditioning it, but the air conditioning is going to cost you much less to run. If you take the office building that I work in, which I designed uh, several years ago, it obeys all these principles. It's an office building, but it's got a, a I'm looking at it now, it's got a deep overhang facing south. Um, you can open all the windows for cross ventilation. It faces due south so that the prevailing breezes in the summer can flow right through it. It's back, uh, the, the north side of the building has fewer windows. That's where the cold winds come from in the, sum, in the winter. But it means that you can sit outside the house on the south side on a winter's day when it's sunny and be quite comfortable. So they're applicable not just to houses, but to architecture generally. And what kind so of that, and that's okay. what that's what I've learned. Um, there's an embodied wisdom there. It seems that it seems that in design, a lot of architects struggle making that leap from applying these these residential principles that have been proven through vernacular and bring it into a larger scale, such as institutional or commercial architecture. How have you resolved that, and what challenges have you seen in your design when trying to apply these similar typologies? Well, different typologies, but similar uh, practices. I think it works very well in larger buildings. You know, I've based my practice on the notion that we would always be doing houses as well as larger buildings, thinking that the principles that we associate with houses, they're comfortable, they're well lit, they're warm, they're intimate, they're friendly to the touch. Well, all of those things would be very nice in a larger building too, if it's a church or a, you know, a school. So uh, the principles do uh, cross-reference from residential to larger buildings. And if you look at the work of the sort of architects that I admire, Al Alvar Alto or Frank Lloyd Wright or you know, currently uh, Peter Zumthor, you will see that their architecture 
so often uses principles that's evident in their residential work in their larger institutional work like museums. So I think there is a lot of connection to be made there. And most of the buildings that I've done, for example, the North, North Carolina Botanical Garden in Chapel Hill, it's a $10 million project and it's about 30,000 square feet. It uses all the same principles that I used in that very small house in Beaufort, South Carolina which is, you know, 1,500 square feet. Frank, I'd like to jump back in time a little bit now and talk about your early days as an architect. There's a lot of younger, up-and-coming architects that listen to the show, and they'd find it valuable to learn about your early experiences and choices and challenges. Uh, Wikipedia says that one of the first firms you worked for was McKin, McMinn, Norfleet, and Wicker. Was that the first firm? Yeah. Um, first firm in America, you know, uh, I studied in England. I studied architecture in England. I, I went there um, thinking I would do a sort of one year abroad. <laughs> and I, I, I just thought the school was so good that I, I completed my education there. So a lot of what I knew early on about architecture I learned from being in England. And that was invaluable to me, too, because... Um, you can you can travel 30 miles in England and the architecture changes because you know it's an it's a, it's an old country and for a, over a thousand years people have been building in the same place and they've learned what works there. So from the northern part of Kent to the southern part of Kent, you'll find that the buildings not radically different, but they're subtly different because they adjust to the landscape or a particular type of materials. You could draw a history of Gothic architecture in England by looking at the soil types in England because that's where the stone came from that they built the buildings with. So what I'm getting at is that it was really valuable for me to study there because I got to see how an older culture had adapted to its place. You know, America, we are a very young culture. Um, my friends in England used to say, in America, you can still smell the paint drying because we're so fresh, you know. <laughs> Our history is barely 300 years old, and the history of Europe is 2,000 years old. But, uh, and don't get me wrong, I love living and working in America. But by going to an older culture, you can see how buildings have adjusted, how buildings have learned from their place and how people use them. So uh, that was a really important part of my education. And uh, if I were to give one piece of advice to a student today, I would say travel. Uh, you, you will learn more about architecture by traveling than in any other way. You will certainly learn more than you learn on the internet or that you even learn in school. You know, I'm, I'm Happy to say that over half of my education in architecture came from traveling. You know, I was studying in London, and so every weekend I could go to a place like Cambridge or, or Bristol or Gloucester uh, on vacations, on, on school holidays. I could go to France or Italy or Greece. And this was like opening an encyclopedia of design, culture, place, habits. Um, so that, that's why I, I so strongly recommend travel. And do you have a favorite place, architecturally speaking, that is fond in your, in your heart? Uh, Aix-en-Provence. It's a, it's a town uh, in the south of France. And I fell in love with that town when I was 25 years old, and I haven't forgotten it. And in fact, I go there uh, sometimes twice a year. I have some very dear friends who live there. And what's unique about Aix that place? Oh, uh, many people think that Aix is the most beautiful city in France. Um, it's made of limestone. It has a lot of fountains uh, from artesian wells. The architecture is restrained and beautifully proportioned. It has these marvelous plane trees, B-L-A-N-E trees, lining all of the streets, the the combination of food, uh, music, uh, uh, sunlight, shadow, uh, 
Uh, it's extraordinary. It's no accident that's the town that Cezanne was born in and grew up in. And I've always, of course, loved his paintings. And his atelier, his studio, is, you know, open to the public today in X. So it, it's a truly beautiful place. It was the first Roman province because it was such an incredibly fertile uh, area for farming, the classic uh, wine, olives, and wheat, and it continues to be uh, today. I, I mean, there's no, there's no great architecture there, you know, no, no cathedral nor great public building, and that's in fact why I like it, because the fabric of the city and the farm buildings is uniformly good but, you know, doesn't attempt to stand out or to be different. So when you were, when you were fresh out of school and you'd been traveling, what were the choices that you were faced with in terms of your career and where did you want to go? Did you have a clear idea of that? Can you kind of walk us through that? Well, um, my girlfriend's parents asked me to design their house. And um, they lived in Virginia. And so after I graduated from school in London, of course, I moved back to Virginia to design their house. <laughs> so um, uh, that's why I decided to move there. Well, that took about a year. And it was clear to me that, um, you know, I, I, I needed to try something else. And so uh, another friend offered me a job in New York and I moved there. Was that with uh, Richard Myron Associates? Yes. Mm -hmm. From 70 to 73, according to Wikipedia. Yes, I worked for Richard for three years. That was a, that was a revelation because it, you know, I had worked in other firms in England and, and in North Carolina, but Richard was the first person who, who demonstrated how much passion an architect needed to get something done well. I mean, he was relentless in, in demanding perfection. So that, that was a, a great education for me. Could you expound on yeah. that a little bit in terms of, you say that it was the first time you'd experienced that sort of passion in an architect and that he was re relentless. Do you have any yes. examples of that, what it was like working in that firm at that time? Well, here's the thing. Uh, to, do a, to do a larger building is an extremely difficult challenge. Um, there are so many people who have the ability to say no uh, and very few people who can say yes. These people include the fire marshal, the building inspector, your cost consultant, your structural engineer, your mechanical engineer. There are just innumerable uh, decisions and compromises that affect any project. I mean, it's really difficult to do a large building. And Richard just would not take no for an answer. He, I mean, he would persevere. So, for example, uh, one of the projects I worked on for him was called the Bronx State School. I don't believe it's called that now, but it was a school for uh, emotionally and physically challenged children. And... The, the, the building inspector just was giving us fits about various aspects of the design. And Richard um, more or less allowed me to work for several weeks researching the code and finding ways that we could prove to the building inspector that what we wanted to do was the right way to do it. In most other offices, that would have just, uh, you, you would have, sort of, you know, capitulated to whatever the regulatory authority was asking for and done it. So um, that was a real eye-opener for me. And has that been the approach that you've taken or how does that affect the way that you design your buildings? Uh, well, as a general principle, I try to design everything so that I would either want to live in it and work in it or study there myself. I mean, that's kind of a basic decision. Okay. So you work for Richard Meyer and you experienced that, that professional rigor that he brought to the design. Correct. And 
where where did you go from there? Well, I decided to move back to England. I was offered a teaching job at my old school, the Architectural Association, and my best two of my best friends lived in London, and uh, we decided that I would move back there. I would teach at the Architectural Association, and uh, we could open a practice together. I should say that what had attracted me to the Architectural Association was that there were about 30 faculty there, all of whom were practicing architects, mostly young. Uh, there were only five full-time faculty who were themselves architects. But the Architectural Association was predicated on the idea that the best teachers are practitioners or architects. Not, I mean, and, and often, you know, very cutting edge architects. One of my uh, teachers was a man named James Sterling, who was a fantastic architect, but he felt that it was really important for him to be in a studio three afternoons a week to be around young people like myself. And ever since, I've thought that was a very good way to both teach and to learn, because it was clear to people like Sterling and some of my other teachers that they really enjoyed being around young, idealistic students. And on the other hand, we really enjoyed having them as our teachers because they knew what it was like out there in the trenches. So they could, they could offer something to us and we could offer something to them. So um, I decided I would go back and do that. I would go back and teach and practice. And I did that for the next six years in England. Um, it, was a, a, it was a good time, but it was also economically a disastrous time in Britain. You couldn't have picked a worse time to open an office because the country was more or less paralyzed by strikes. I remember when we moved to London, um, they were having a coal miner strike, and so the power could only be on for eight hours a day. I mean, it was just shocking. You know, a, an industrialized, civilized country like England had been reduced to that level of chaos. So it was an interesting time. You know. How did you find projects during that time, and was it difficult to balance the, the academics and then also practicing at the same time? Uh, no, it wasn't difficult. Um, it's become more difficult recently, but at the time it was a given that most teachers could also practice. I, I think it's just a, an invaluable connection. Um, so I, I was able to do that. Most of my clients came from people that I knew. You know? I mean, if you can imagine uh, an American, and my partner was a South African, starting out in London. <laughs> um, it was quite a challenge, but mostly it was people we knew. We had a good friend who wanted to build a golf club, a, a golf clubhouse. And so we designed his golf clubhouse for him, and um, it was an interesting time. But in it, ultimately, we were just never able to get off the ground. Yeah. Was, was that your first stab at running your own practice? Yeah, and I, I like to say that every architect has two practices and the second one succeeds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Frank, could you tell me a few of the lessons that you learned from that, um, that venture that helped your present venture succeed? Well, um, you know, choose your partners very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me more um, on that? Well, the three of us who came together to have this practice were all chiefs and we didn't have any, you know, we didn't have any subordinates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, as, as they say in Texas, big hat, no cattle. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so everybody, you know, everybody was the boss and that didn't work well. And um, I found really I was much happier sort of piloting my own ship after that. So that's something that I learned. Hopefully it's not an ignorant question, but why why didn't that work well to have three partners who were the leaders, so to speak? Because nobody could, you know, we were constantly redesigning everything. You know? 
<laughs> so you would look at your partner's design and say, well, we should probably change this. And they would get a hold of it and change it back. Was it that sort of deal? Mostly they looked at mine. And say, <laughs> 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 uh, you know, looking back on it, I mean, look, gosh, you know, this is 30 years ago. Looking back on it with the sort of wisdom one gets with age about dealing with people, we probably could have resolved it. But at that age, in our you know early 30s, it was very hard to do that. You know? At that age, you're, you're really trying to prove that you can do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and you're not very comfortable with compromise. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, were we to do it again now, it would have worked. But back then, it, and, and the irony is that I've, as a result, I've remained best friends with these two people. Well, that's Whereas wonderful. Whereas if we continued in practice, we probably wouldn't be. I've seen that happen, actually. People come back together. I have, two, I have two friends in London, and they were best of friends when they started their practice. And now they still have a practice together, but they don't speak to each other. You know, so it's <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> that sounds I'd rather, rather have friends. <laughs> sounds rather difficult. Yeah, yeah. So one is choose your partners wisely. Any other takeaways from that, that time period? Um, well, um, about the firm. Oh, oh I, th I think the most important thing to do is to, is to only do projects that you believe in. And why you is know, that, Frank? Because ultimately your integrity depends on that. I, I have a friend who's an architect in Australia. His name is Glenn Merka. Never heard of him. And he, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, he's a, he's a very wonderful and genial man. I admire his work. Yeah. Oh, well, you, I mean, have you met him? I think I heard him speak once when he came to school, but I've never yeah, met him personally. Absolutely down, very down to words, friendly guy. Uh, I spent a week traveling around with him in um, New Mexico and Arizona. And, um, Glenn was the, the oldest person in our party, but without a doubt, the youngest in spirit. You know, he was interested in absolutely everything. He was curious about everything. Anyway, what Glenn always tells people is that the compromise you make on this project is where your next client will want to start. Mm -hmm. Right about that. So you choose projects that you believe in. You know. Another one of his saying is, is, you know, start out where you want to end up. So many young folks start out by saying, well, I'll take this job because it's, I know it's not the best architecture. I know it's not the best firm. Maybe they have, don't have the highest principles, but I'll make my way and it'll get better and so on. And I, I don't think that's true. I think you have to start out where you believe and you need to start out where you want to finish. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.